It's a real honor to stand in front of you and to have you give me your attention. And it's a real honor to be in this beautiful place, this theatrical place. And it is about place that I'd like to talk because we are at a transformative, evolutionary shift about place because the concept of place has changed forever. Now, everybody in this room didn't choose your parents, right? Which means you didn't choose where you were raised. That was done unto you. And it's a really formative experience, right? Childhood and where you were raised. And yet we don't really think about how much place shapes who we are, how we think. But it is something we always kind of intuitively know is important. And I'm sure that uh, all of you have had this experience. You know, you get on the plane, buckled up, haven't quite put on your noise reduction headset, or you've just had your first day of vacation in a wonderful resort, and you're just sitting down to have a nice cold drink, look at this beautiful visage, and somebody comes up to you, sits down next to you, and says, so, where are you from, right? But intuitively, we know to lead with that, even though that's not a very smart, intelligent way to open a conversation. But why do we do that? Because place has always shaped us. It shaped us our entire lives and the entire history of humanity. Why? Because where we live. If we live in France, we live differently than if we live in South Florida. How we speak, if we're born in Alabama, we speak differently than if we're born in Boston or born in Hamburg. We speak differently because of our placeness, right? What we think and believe is obviously clear. If you live in Mumbai, you think differently than if you live in Baghdad because of your placeness. You know, how we live, the way we live, if you live on the equator, you live differently than if you live above the Arctic Circle. Completely different ways to live simply because of the place in which you are living. What we eat, that's pretty obvious. National cuisines came about because nations are places and cuisines kind of bubbled up within that nation state. And of course, who we root for. I mean, if you're rooting for the Toronto Maple Leafs or you're rooting for the Boston Red Sox or Manchester United, it is probably because you live near there or you grew up there or you passed through there. Or who do you root for in college, right? Most of us are out of college here, most of us, and yet we root for our college team because we spent four years there. So that was the place. It meant a lot to us. So we're going to root for that team through good and bad. It's kind of interesting. So place really defines us, but it also limits us, and it has limited us throughout history. Just think about how you learned about ancient civilizations. You know, you learn about them individually. But that's because place kept them apart. Now, the Roman Empire, a little bit before BC, at about 476 AD, happened in the Mediterranean. It was a great civilization. We have read about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Decline and fall in large part because it imploded on itself. It didn't have any interactivity with any place else. And it could have because simultaneously to the Roman Empire were the great dynasties of China. Chinese never interacted with the Romans because place, distance, kept them apart. At the same time, there was the Mayan civilization. All three of these civilizations coexisted, but they didn't know that they did because the distance kept them apart. They were completely based within place. Remember that if you think about history, how we learn about them separately. What if these three existed today? We'd know about everything that was going on within 24 hours, right? We're all so connected. So place is really limited civilization. Now, the agricultural age started 10,000 years ago. And that's where the concept of place began. Because we stopped following the food and following the weather and put down roots, literally, and place began. So the 10,000 years of the agricultural age is when all the great civilizations and all the great religions that come to mind occurred, up until about 200 years ago. So only in the last 2% of the 
of all of recorded history has distance begun to shrink, and that's because of technology. Technology and connectivity shrinks distance. Clearly, 200 years ago, roughly, the telegraph. That was the first thing that closed distance, that started to make the world smaller. The radio, 100 years ago, roughly, you know, market penetration, first electronic medium. Landline, 75 years later. Television, 60 years later. And the internet. But if you look at these words and you think about when they first came into being, they were entirely place-based, right? You had to go to the, where the telegraph was. You had to plug the radio in, in the home. You had to have the television in the living room. The landline was connected to the wall. And even the early stage of the internet was connected to a wire. So even though these technologies shortened distance, made the world smaller as referred to it, we still were stuck in places. The profound thing is cellular connectivity. Completely eliminates the concept of place. Why? There's 7 billion of us, a little bit more, closer to 7.1 billion now, on this planet. And 5.6 billion of us have cell phones. Take away the very young and those that are in the remotest parts of the world, and you have cell phone ubiquity. What does that mean? It means if I were to call anybody in this beautiful room on a cell phone, cell phone to cell phone, right? 1, 1,002, 1, 1,003, 1,004, 1,000, 1, 000, five seconds your phone would ring. If I were to call somebody in another continent 12,000 miles away, maybe another two seconds because of the relay of the satellite. So the first thing that cell phone ubiquity means is there's no time or distance limiting human communication. You couldn't say that 10 years ago. You certainly couldn't say it 100 years ago. And when you're on a cell phone, cell phone, cell phone, after, hey, how you doing? One of the things you ask is, so where are you? Right? <laughs> or in my case, what time zone are you in? Is it OK to talk? So there's no time, distance, or place any longer limiting human communication. That could not be said even five years ago, let alone all of recorded history. So there's no time, distance, or place limiting human communication. Human communication is one of the things that we humans do more than almost anything else. We communicate. So the concept of placeness has left one of our major activities. We've gone from place to space. Think about that. Think if you had a grandma who, say, been dead more than 10 years and she would have come back to you today, and you would go, Grandma, I got this great space I go to to hang out with my friends. I got this great space I go to where I can buy anything I want. I got this great space where I can watch a movie. I got this great space where I can go and learn about anything I want that has ever existed. And she'd go, wait, honey, don't you have to go to the playground to be, play with your, kid, or your friends? And don't you have to go to a shopping center to buy something? And, and don't you have to go to a theater to see a movie? And, and, and don't you have to go to the library to find out? And you go, no, it's called cyberspace. So everybody in this room and a current iteration of humanity, it's the first time that a majority of humanity can share the same space. And the digital natives, as I call them, those born from 1997 to now, is the first, you know, digital natives, right? Because they're the first generation born into the digital landscape. Everybody older than that is a digital immigrant into the digital <laughs> landscape. So they are the first generation in human history who will spend their entire life completely living in a global space. So think about that. So I was thinking about this stuff, and I was going down some other thought. I looked up the definition of utopia. I was following some other line of reasoning. Here's the definition of utopia. Ancient Greek, utopia means no place. Thomas More, 1605, called it nowhere. Again, they were place-based. Utopia can't exist. There's no such place as that. That made me think of one of my great intellectual heroes, Buckminster Fuller. Now, Buckminster Fuller said several decades ago that humanity is moving to a fork in the road. The fork in the road is utopia or oblivion. So hopefully the fact that the concept of space has been changed forever is giving us an indication as to the road we're going to take.
Thank you.